All right, let's get started. So welcome uh, to our Rural EMS Education Series. I'm Andra Farkas. I recognize a lot of names and a lot of faces on tonight. But for those of you guys that don't know me, I'm one of the EMS docs over at the University of Colorado Hospital. I do medical direction for a couple of EMS agencies, um, mostly very rural. Um, and it's good to see you guys. I'm going to turn my camera off because my computer likes to struggle to run PowerPoint, Zoom, and my face at the same time. Uh, but obviously, I am here. And if you have any questions, uh, please type them in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, if you have uh, answers to the things I'm asking, please also do the same. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the chat. Uh, the title is My Tummy Hurts, which was uh, definitely uh, come up with by Dr. Angela Wright, who has several small children, because I would have never... Um, said this title, but um, I really like it. So we're just going to talk a little bit about GI emergencies and all of the things that can present as abdominal pain. So a couple of objectives, we're going to renew, uh, review very briefly the anatomy and physiology of the abdominal cavity. You're going to discuss some major pathologies that can cause abdominal pain. You're going to understand the life-threatening causes of abdominal pain and discuss some important rural transport considerations in folks who present with um, GI or abdominal emergency. Um, and like I said, the CE process we will talk about afterwards. So no need to put your name or anything like that in the chat um, or email us. We will, um, it'll be much easier at the end of the talk. All right, so there's obviously a ton of structures in the abdominal cavity and there's a ton of ways that they can go wrong, right? And we're certainly not going to be able to cover it all, uh, but we're going to cover just a couple of high yield, um, common and life threatening problems. Um, and we'll go through a little bit of all of these, um, all of these types of organs. So when we're talking about solid organs, a couple of big ones we always think about is the liver. Um, obviously, it's quite large. It's the second largest organ after the skin hangs out under the rib cage there on the right upper quadrant of the abdomen does some pretty important th things like producing some chemicals that are needed for digestion and for detox de detoxification, among others. The spleen is on the other side, on the left, in the left upper quadrant, uh, does some filtering blood functions. The kidneys, certainly also very important, located just under the rib cage, either side, being shaped about the size of a fist. They remove waste products from the blood. And then the pancreas right there in the middle um, does a lot of things, but mostly digestion and um, insulin secretion and kind of glucose management. We will not talk about trauma tonight, uh, but the solid organs are those that will bleed um, when injured, whereas the hollow organs are those that will kind of rupture their contents um, when they are injured. A couple of the big ones is the gallbladder which is right up there under the liver. And then certainly the intestine, both small and large bowel. And um, we'll talk about their functions more in detail, but in general, the gallbladder is gonna store, store bile. Intestine is gonna help with absorbing things and uh, moving ingested contents. A lot of the hollow organs we're gonna talk about have a lot of really irritating contents. Um, and when they burst, right, they spill those contents into the abdominal cavity or the peritoneal cavity and can cause a lot of inflammation, infection, and what we call peritonitis, which we'll talk about a little bit more. So just remember that um, that's kind of the main way they cause issues. And then, you know, a lot of diagrams kind of show the organs just floating around, free floating. They're actually held in place and quite cushioned um, by a couple of structures. The omentum is this really large, flat adipose tissue. So it's a bunch of fat there. Um, it's on the surface of the organs has a couple of key functions, including some immunological functions. Um, then there's the mesentery, which is that fold of membrane that attaches the intestine to the wall around the stomach area and kind of holds it in place. And then um, there's certainly the peritoneum. So remember, the peritoneum is that membrane that lines everything. There's one on the outside, lines the abdominal wall. wall. There's one on the inside that kind of lines the, uh, the important organs. And then remember, there's also this retroperitoneal space that we talk about where the kidneys and part of the pancreas and some other um, pretty important things live. And certainly there's a ton of blood vessels in the abdomen, right? Got some big arteries, big aorta there can cause a lot of problems, um, some smaller arteries there, and then certainly a lot of veins, including the IVC, um, the iliacs, and a couple of each, each of the little organs have their own veins. And then certainly the GU organs are in there as well. Most notably the bladder, but then also kind of the ovaries and fallopian tubes um, and all of that. And then certainly the scrotum in males is um, related and connected. 
as you kind of navigating GI complaints, remember to just think about this like basic layout of the structures. Um, Cause depending on where the patient's tender, right? Obviously or where they're having pain will kind of at least help guide you as to what may be going on. So remember, right? Upper quadrant has the liver and gallbladder. Um, and then a little bit of the pancreas is there as well. Um, the left upper quadrant mostly has the spleen, uh, but the stomach as well, a little bit of the pancreas, mostly epigastric. And then in the right lower quadrant, you're going to have your appendix, which is going to be important, as well as certainly the um, GU structures, fallopian tubes and ovaries and all that. And then in the left lower, you're going to have a lot of colon. And throughout, you have a lot of the small and large bowel as well. But the, the big stuff that we're going to talk about is going to be kind of in the right, specifically in an area that you can um, make sure to use to your advantage for diagnosis. So unless anyone has any burning questions, um, I think one of my favorite ways to learn is cases. So I'm just going to jump into some cases. All right. You are dispatched to a 16-year-old female with right lower quadrant abdominal pain. On arrival, she looks uncomfortable, but she's pretty well appearing. She's kind of lying still, doesn't really want to move around a lot. You get a little bit of the story. She initially started kind of diffusely. Now it's really in that right lower quadrant. She's also had nausea and vomiting with all of this. No medical problems, allergies, medications, none of that. Never had any operations. Um, hasn't been eaten, eating much or drinking much because she's been so nauseous and uncomfortable. Um, and it's just kind of progressively gotten worse over the last day or so. Vital signs, pretty good. Maybe a little tachycardic, 100. But, you know, not frankly febrile, breathing okay, looking okay, blood pressure is okay. On your exam, we'll just talk about the focused, important stuff. But you... Uh, she's pretty tender in that right lower quadrant, and she has some rebound tenderness, uh, which and some guarding. Remember, rebound tenderness is kind of when it hurts more when you let go, and then guarding is that um, toughening of the muscles, that contraction of the muscles, whether it's voluntary or involuntary, both that kind of make you think some peritonitis, something bad's going on. What else do you want to know, and what's on your list of things that could be going on with this patient? You can type it in the chat, unmute, tell me your thoughts. Appendix, sexually active. I love that question. Great. <clears throat> Ask if she could be pregnant. Absolutely. <clears throat> so this one is appendicitis, <clears throat> but those keep those questions in mind because we will definitely talk about that more. A um, little bit about appendicitis. I don't know how many of y'all still have your appendix, uh, but a lot of people have had it taken out. It's this skinny little dead end pouch that comes off of the cecum. And it's right in that area where the small bowel transitions to the large bowel. It's usually pretty narrow and pretty small. It's total volume to give you an idea is like 0.3 ml. So it's like super teeny tiny when it's not inflamed. Um, and then in so it, while we usually say it's that area there in that right lower quadrant, in some people it can be placed a little bit differently. Some people may actually have it higher up or more posterior. Um, in most people, though, it lies under what we call McBurney's point. If you look at this line from the um, the superior iliac spine and the umbilicus, if you go about a third of the way up, that's McBurney's point. And that is classically where a lot of um, people with appendicitis will have um, abdominal pain and tenderness when you're examining them. Uh, we're not really sure what the appendix does. Maybe it's leftover from something else. It may have some good bacteria that kind of helps. Uh, but really, we don't think about it until it causes problems, right? The classic, classic description of pain and appendicitis is that it starts kind of centralized because it hasn't started irritating that peritoneum yet. It's just kind of that visceral pain. And then as it gets worse and worse, and potentially as it um, gets more inflamed, then it moves kind of down to that lo more localized area. Someone asked about fever. Didn't have a fever today. Um, and then you guys know, you ask, and nobody really knows if they had a fever or not. They don't own a, a thermometer. Maybe they had a fever. Who knows? Presentation in appendicitis is, like I said, usually vague abdominal discomfort that's poorly localized, but then it does tend to kind of migrate to that right lower quadrant. They have nausea, vomiting. They may have fever. With it, it is an infection. Um, and usually it's been about less than 48 hours that it's been going on. What happens is basically there's a little stone, most likely, that gets stuck in there. Uh, appendicolith is what it's called, like a little calcium stone. And, you know, the appendix is lined with um, mucosa that's going to secrete some stuff, right? And when there's a stone there, it keeps secreting, but it has nowhere to go. So it gets more inflamed and more angry. 
it stretches, which causes pain, right? Anytime you stretch something, the receptors on the surface are going to cause pain. Um, and then it's going to get worse and worse and worse. If it's not treated soon, it can burst sometimes. So it can actually perforate um, and they can certainly look um, a little bit more ill. In a patient with appendicitis, just your classic appendicitis, if you're otherwise pretty normal and healthy, they shouldn't really look super sick. But if it's been longer than a couple of days and um, they're ruptured, they can certainly have sepsis and be pretty, uh, pretty uncomfortable looking and pretty ill looking. What do we do in the pre-hospital realm? You know, obviously symptomatic care is going to be your number one thing. Pain meds, nodule meds, whatever that looks like for your agency. And then IV fluids too. Um, you know, if they've been having a lot of vomiting, if they look dehydrated, um, give them some, some IV fluids as well. When they get to the hospital, the way we usually make the diagnosis, you know, back in the day, they used to kind of take the appendix out without any confirmation um, of whether it was appendicitis or not. But nowadays with CT scanners, um, it's usually the way we make that diagnosis. In kids, we may try ultrasound as well. And in pregnant patients, we may do ultrasound, but CT is really the, the big way we diagnose this. And then there's been, you know, classically, we were taught that you take out the appendix um, with surgery, but sometimes you do antibiotics. There's been some data that in some patients, just giving them some antibiotics um, actually is enough, uh, but that's kind of more of a of a surgeon question. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much what we do is either take them out and give them some antibiotics. Any questions about appendicitis before we move on? Pretty bread and butter case to start with. <clears throat> All right. Just feel free to pop them in the chat if you have a question, but we'll keep going. So same exact story. For case two, you're dispatched to a 16-year-old female with right lower quadrant abdominal pain. Same exact thing. She looks uncomfortable, but she's not terrible looking, and she's lying pretty still. Same exact story. Kind of started diffusely, then it progressed to the left. Still nauseous, still vomiting. However, her vital signs are not quite the same. If you remember, the other one, blood pressure was like 120s. She's pretty hypotensive, 70s over 50s. Pretty tachycardic, breathing pretty fast and kind of same temperature there. Same exact exam, still tender, um, some rebound gardeners in that right lower quadrant. And you guys had alluded to this, so I won't um, make you ask it for this case because a lot of you guys asked this question, but she's like, oh, by the way, I'm sexually active and I haven't had a period in two months and had a positive pregnancy test yesterday. Yeah, ectopic pregnancy, certainly very high on the list. Um, anything else that it could be beyond ectopic? Brought to a topic. Yeah, that's a scary one. Polyp. Let's say she just has a regular period. So missing a period is not a big deal. Brought to an appendix. Yeah. Could be ovarian too, right? Intestine. Yeah, absolutely. All of those things. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this one was ectopic pregnancy, but we'll talk about a couple other diagnoses that could kind of mimic this. So um, ectopic pregnancy, remember a regular or normal pregnancy that will proceed um, to be successful is when a fertilized egg implants in the actual um, uterus lining. An ectopic pregnancy, it implants somewhere outside of that, most commonly in the fallopian tube, um, sometimes in other parts of this whole uh, pathway. It is actually a, a pretty leading cause of maternal morta mortality within the first trimester, um, anywhere from like nine to 15%. Um, and it's not uncommon. Um, certainly not like everyone has had one, but it's, it's certainly not uncommon. Um, the risk factors to consider is um, if you've had uh, pelvic inflammatory disease before, pretty much anything that will kind of irritate that um, uh, fallopian tube, uh, pelvic, pelvic inflammatory disease, if you've had previous ectopics, if you've had any tubal surgeries, um, and if you've had some risk from IUDs as well, although that's pretty small, um, if you have multiple sexual partners and then smoking is also a risk factor. And then certainly in vitro fertilization, people who get IVF, uh, question about if the pain will be in the left lower quadrant, if the pregnancy was on the other tube. Yes. Yeah, so this patient right here, if this is on the left, they would had, um, they would have to have left lower quadrant pain. Exactly. 
patients with an ectopic, a regular ectopic pregnancy, we'll talk about ectopic and then ruptured ectopic. Um, so patients with an ectopic pregnancy will commonly present with some pain and some vaginal bleeding within the first like six to 10 weeks gestation. However, a lot of pregnancies, if they're in the, you know, in the endometrium still present with vaginal bleeding and some abdominal pain. So it's certainly, you know, we, we look for the ectopics every time someone comes in with vaginal bleeding and pain when they're pregnant. Uh, but a lot of the time it can be something that's completely normal and go on to be a completely normal pregnancy. Um, when we get worried, as someone had alluded to in the chat, is when that ectopic ruptures, right? As the uh, ectopic is growing, it kind of starts to stretch the area around it, stretches the blood supply, puts it at risk of rupturing and blood supply rupturing, and you can hemorrhage into your um, pelvic uh, cavity and your abdominal cavity, right? Um, this, in addition to some vaginal pain and bleeding, can have some referred pain to the shoulder. That's because of that blood inside the abdominal cavity that irritates the diaphragm. And remember, our nerves get confused sometimes. And so they think the pain is coming from the shoulder, but it's really the, the top of the diaphragm. Um, and then anytime a childbearing age female has syncope um, <clears throat> or, and abdominal pain or is in shock, this is something that we need to consider. Uh, very strongly consider that. A lot of ectopics will be, you know, people of childbearing age, which usually tend to be younger um, and uh, don't have a lot of comorbidities, right? So if you do have a ruptured ectopic, a lot of the time you're able to kind of mount a pretty remarkable hemodynamic compensation, can stay tachycardic for quite a while. Um, but certainly once they're decompensating and getting hypotensive, that's concerning for pretty significant intraperitoneal bleeding. So what are you going to do? You're going to recognize it. You're going to think about it. You're going to have that clinical suspicion. You're going to get some IV access. You're going to resuscitate, right? Right now it's fluids. At some point, maybe there'll be pre-hospital blood, but you're going to resuscitate that patient and give them some pain meds if their blood pressure allows. And you're going to transport them. Um, we will talk a little bit more about transport destinations and kind of the rural considerations of that at the end, um, rather than with each case. But this is certainly something that you know, maybe you'll need to fly out, right? Depending on how far you are and what the, the uh, available hospitals close to you can do. And then when they get to the hospital, if they are not ruptured, a lot of the time it can just be medical management. Um, but if they are ruptured or if they're too far along, um, it'll be surgical management. Other things to consider in that general <clears throat> lower quadrant area, um, specifically right lower, but certainly on the left as well, right? Because we have ovaries on both sides, um, is ovarian torsion. And this is a time-sensitive diagnosis. Um, remember, the ovaries are kind of attached by these ligaments where the blood vessels are, has a couple of blood vessels. But what can happen is they can twist on themselves. And when you twist on yourself, the blood vessels get oh, twisted up too. And so no blood in, no blood out. They get edematous. They get um, necrotic, basically, if it's if it's long enough, right? If it's been long enough since the twisting happened. The main risk factor is an ovarian mass. Um, and a mass that is five centimeter in diameter or larger tends to be kind of that breaking point where we worry about torsion. Whether that's a large ovary um, assist or if that's something more uh, pathologic like ovarian cancer, um, all of those things, if they're bigger than five centimeters, can kind of increase that chance of twisting on itself. Happens in females of all ages. Um, certainly not just in childbearing age. It is more common in childbearing age, but it happens in all ages. So I've seen torsion in people who are in like their 60s and 70s. It presents with lower abdominal pain, some pelvic pain. It may radiate to the belly, the back, the flank. Um, it may be intermittent or it may be constant. It kind of depends if it's torsing and detorsing, which we can see, then you may have some really bad pain and then kind of gets better and then really bad pain again. Nausea and vomiting, certainly just from that, you know, pain reaction. Um, and then if the ovary is necrotic already and already um, losing blood flow and everything else, then it may, you may have a fever, but that's pretty rare. Vital signs just kind of look like someone in pain, right? They shouldn't really be hypotensive. Um, and so just a little bit tachycardic, maybe a little hypertensive. And on exam, they're going to have tenderness over that lower quadrant, right? Whether it's left or right um, in that pelvic area. Um, does torsion occur because of type of physical activity or just happens? Good question. It can, it can be both. Um, there's no particular physical activity that I know of that like predicts it. Um, but it can be, I have heard of it happening in like the context of physical activity, but it can also happen just at rest. Um, can just kind of twist on itself.
Great question. Pre-hospital, what are you going to do? Kind of the same stuff, right? You're going to recognize it, have a high suspicion for it, supportive care, meds, um, IVs, everything else, and then rapid transport. Um, and then in the hospital, this is usually a surgical intervention. I mean, if we really do think it's a torsion, they need to go to the operating room to get it untorsed. Um, and then plus or minus, depending on how long it's been torsed, may need to come out completely. Um, it is a time-sensitive diagnosis, not only for preserving fertility, but also because you can imagine having an acrotic anything inside your belly is not great. Um, but really, the, the the thing we focus on is kind of preserving that fertility, um, if that's desired in the patient. And then just like ovaries can torse, testicles can torse too, right? So if this patient was 16 and male, you got to think about testicular torsion. Um, kind of similar, it, it happens when it rotates around a spermatic cord, um, and then the blood supply, which is all in here, it gets um, impaired, obviously. So you're going to have no blood flow out, no blood flow in, et cetera. Um, it can happen at any age, but really more commonly happens either really soon after birth or in like the teenage years, 12 to 18, with peak in like 13 to 14. It presents with testicular pain and nausea and vomiting. But it can present with abdominal pain too, because it kind of radiates up in there. And especially if it's like a, you know, pediatric patient, like you can see this in like six months old, um, they're not going to be able to tell you um, that they have testicular pain. They're just going to be crying. And then in teenagers, imagine like a 13 year old may not be comfortable talking about the fact that they have testicular pain and then just say they have belly pain, right? Which they do, it's radiated um, to the belly as well. So just consider this in young um at males with abdominal pain and kind of the lower abdomen. This is also a surgical emergency um, for the time it takes between when it starts and when you kind of tend to develop ischemia is about four to eight hours. It does vary. There's cases where 24 hours out, it can still be salvaged, et cetera. But usually about four to eight hours is kind of that, that key time. Same thing with the ovarian torsion. You're going to recognize supportive care and rapid transport. Um, in the hospital, when they come to the emergency department and we diagnose them with the torsion, we can actually tors it ourselves in the emergency department. So you just kind of twist it. Um, it's called opening the book procedure, but that's not definitive. That relieves the immediate torsion and immediate um, symptoms and issue, but they still need to go to the operating room because they need to have that testicle basically tacked down so that it doesn't do that again. Um, and sometimes they do need to go to the operating room because the procedure won't work. Any questions? Men with bell clapper deformity are more susceptible to torsion. Yes, thank you, Justin. That is very true. TXA be appropriate and ruptured ectopic with hemodynamic instability. Ooh, that is a great question. Um, it hasn't been studied. Uh, so do I think theoretically it could be helpful? Sure, but there's no evidence on that. Um, we don't have any studies on it. If you want to study it, Josie, I think it's a, it'd be a great um, randomized control trial. But I, there is no evidence out there that I know of, and I don't know of any systems or hospitals that are really doing it. But that's a that's a great question. TXA for everyone, for everything. <clears throat> I do not receive sponsorship from the makers of TXA. I feel like I should say that. All right. Case number three. You are dispatched to a 36-year-old female, and this time it's right upper quadrant abdominal pain. So a little bit older, different location. Again, looks uncomfortable, but doesn't look terrible. Kind of just hanging out, lying still. You find out that uh, it was pretty acute onset of abdominal pain after I had some pizza for dinner, uh, maybe about 30 minutes to an hour after, um, and then nausea and vomiting too. Um, no allergies, no meds, no medical conditions, and hasn't really been eating and drinking much, obviously, because the belly hurts since the pizza. <laughs> Gallbladder, absolutely. Um, blood pressure is pretty good. Heart rate's pretty good. Vitals are otherwise pretty good. And certainly, like you guys alluded to, in the right upper quadrant is where she is tender and has some rebound and guarding. <clears throat> So a couple of, there's like a spectrum of diseases with the gallbladder. So um, this is one of my favorite comics, by the way, about the gallbladder. Uh, but remember the gallbladder is this sac, basically, that's connected to the intestines and the liver. It lives just under the liver. So the liver is like right here. Um, and the liver makes bile and a lot of it goes out into the intestine, but some of it gets stored in the gallbladder, right? 
Bile is this thick liquid that's produced by the liver to help digest fat. It actually makes a lot. It makes up to like a liter a day. Um, but some of that is stored in the gallbladder. So when you eat, the gallbladder has this like thin muscular wall and it squeezes um, bile out through here and it goes into the intestine to help you digest, right? The more fat you eat, so something like a delicious but fatty piece of pizza, the more the gallbladder kind of injects into the digestive tract and the harder it squeezes. Bile is a pretty delicate chemical balance. It's a bunch of cholesterol. Um, so if it gets even a little bit off, the cholesterol can crystallize and kind of stick to the walls of the gallbladder. And over time, the crystals can combine and form gallstones, right? Which is what we call cholelithiasis. About 20% of people have gallstones, but a lot of them won't even know they have them until they start to cause problems or if they happen to get imaging for another reason and they kind of see them there. Um, what can happen is if you have gallstones, you know, you eat a fatty meal, the gallbladder contracts and one of these stones can get stuck there um, and cause some distension, right? Which anytime um, any organ is distended, the nerve fibers are irritated. So it's going to be painful. Um, it's going to cause some nausea as well. Um, but if it's just that and the obstruction relieves itself as the gallbladder calms down, the stone goes back in the gallbladder, then that's it. And that's what we call biliary colic or symptomatic cholelithiasis or symptomatic gallstones. In general, risk factors for having gallbladder problems or gallstones are um, female overweight, um, Hispanic, Native American, increasing age, and then pregnancy and hormone use are risk factors as well. Cholecystitis, on the other hand, is um, kind of like a more, you know, end stage further along the spectrum disease of the gallbladder. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if the gallbladder little uh, opening here persists to remain blocked, then it's going to get really inflamed, um, necrotic, uh, infected, etc. Um, and it's going to cause more persistent pain. Um, and that's when we have to do something about it. And then certainly <clears throat> with stones, um, got to think about where else can the stones get stuck, right? This very long word, cholelithiasis, is basically um, means that a gallstone got out into the, the, the duct that goes to the, um, to the intestine. If it's obstructed, then you can actually have inflammation um, and then infection that kind of rises up on the duct. Um, and that's called ascending cholangitis. This is rare, but folks who get inflammation Infection, inflammation of this and it ascends up are really, really sick. Um, they may be jaundiced, they may have a fever, they may be septic, they don't look good. Cholecystitis, gallbladder problems, they look uncomfortable, but they don't look septic, they don't look ill usually. Um, but ascending cholangitis is bad and they look bad. So, what do we do about the gallbladder? Again, recognition, supportive care, and then if they look sick, you want to get them to the hospital sooner rather than later. Fluids if they're hypotensive, etc. In the hospital, depending on what's going on, so if it's cholecystitis or cholangitis, we'll give them some antibiotics. A lot of the times for both of those, well, for cholecystitis, the gallbladder will need to come out, whether that's surgical or interventional radiology, depending on the patient's risk factors. And then if it's um, ascending cholangitis or a stone problem in the ducts, that's usually the interventional GI folks who will go in and try to get that out. So either way, they need a procedure and they need some antibiotics. Any questions about the gallbladder? Some. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. You were dispatched to a 42-year-old male with abdominal pain. He's pretty uncomfortable. He's actively vomiting when you get there. <clears throat> he tells you that it kind of started epigastric. Um, it radiates to the back. He's been nauseous. He's been vomiting a lot. He doesn't have, uh, doesn't take any medications, but he does have some alcohol um, cirrhosis. He hasn't eaten in a couple of days. And this all kind of started after a few days of drinking heavily. He was sober for a while and then unfortunately um, started drinking again. His blood pressure is okay. He's a little bit tachycardic, um, looks a little uncomfortable, but otherwise vital signs are not scary. On his exam, he's pretty tender and he's guarding in the upper abdomen and epigastric area and he's pretty dry. Anything else you wanna know and what are you thinking of? I see liver, liver certainly on the list of things it could be, absolutely. Stomach ulcer, ooh, I love it, yep, yep, yep. 
No blood in the vomit. Doesn't look like, it just looks like liquid. Good question, Justin. <clears throat> Pancreatitis. Yep. Nailed it. Although we will talk about all the other things it could have been. So remember the pancreas, <clears throat> this little organ that sits kind of posterior to the stomach, um, deep inside the abdominal cavity. And part of it is in the retroperitoneum as well. Its function is to form digestive enzymes that break down carbs, break down proteins, break down lipids, et cetera. Um, and then there's a little duct here where it um, excretes through the, to the um, intestine as well. It also does, it forms insulin, right? Um, and so it, it's control of like glucose management for the body. Pancreatitis happens when the pancreas gets really inflamed. Two main causes is either when a stone or something else is blocking the duct or pretty heavy alcohol use. You can also have some infection, cancer, trauma, surgery, et cetera. But those are the two main, either stones or alcohol use. The way alcohol does it. So you can imagine if you have a gallstone and it gets stuck in this little right opening in between you're not going to be able to um, secrete all of those enzymes and so it's going to get angry and inflamed the way alcohol causes it is that it increases the viscosity of the secretion so it makes them thicker which leads to some protein plugs that kind of get stuck in these tiny little ducts which then form into stones right calculi and there it causes inflammation and fibrosis and you know all of that stuff and it just gets more and more inflamed in acute pancreatitis, pain will usually be in the upper abdomen um, with some radiation to the back. Because remember, part of the pancreas is in the retroperitoneum um, and part of it is in the abdominal cavity. Um, they're pretty tender to palpation um, when you're examining them, mostly epigastric, um, and they'll have a lot of nausea and vomiting as well. Pancreatitis itself, just acute pancreatitis, isn't an immediate life threat. It certainly needs to be dealt with. It needs to be treated, but it's not like a, you know, heart attack. It's, it's scary and it's concerning, but it's not an immediate life threat. However, it can get infected and it can actually get septic. It can form all these cysts in there, especially if they have multiple bouts of pancreatitis um, that can burst and cause infection. They can have like a systemic inflammatory response syndrome, SIRS, where they look high fevers and systemic shock and stuff. So they can certainly get sick pretty quickly. You can also have chronic pancreatitis. Um, and with this, uh, you have a couple bouts of pancreatitis and the pancreas doesn't function as well anymore because of all that fibrosis. So you're going to have glucose uh, issues. You're going to have digestive issues as well. What are you going to do? Fluids and pain and nausea management is huge in these folks. Um, we used to flood them with fluids, like a ton, a ton, a ton of fluids in the hospital and pre-hospital. Now we're saying more conservative fluid management because um, they, were, they were third spacing. So the fluids weren't going into their intravascular space. It was, it was causing them a lot of edema and such. And so now we have a bit more conservative fluid management, but they still need fluids and they still need pain meds and nausea meds. Um, the way we diagnose it in the hospital is either with story and lab or with story and CT scan. Often at time, it's just a lab. We don't need to do the imaging. Um, we treat the same way, fluids and pain and nausea management, and then kind of pancreas rest, meaning keep them nothing by mouth so that the pancreas doesn't have to secrete all those enzymes to digest, um, has a time to kind of relax, give them a lot of, like give them fluids with IV so they don't get dehydrated. Um, and uh, it kind of heals itself basically. But because we were talking about um, <clears throat> alcohol use disorder and everything else, talk a little bit about the GI effects. So this is kind of the progression of liver damage with alcohol consumption, um, you know, from normal to a little bit of statosis, some fibrosis, and then you go to cirrhosis and um, sometimes all the way to hepatocellular carcinoma, which is the, the cancer. The liver has a couple of, a lot of functions actually does a lot of things, but two of the main ones is, um, you know, it has like a lot of portal vessels in there. And so if the liver gets congested, these vessels back up. So when these vessels back up, the other vessels that drain into it back up as well. So that's when you see the esophageal varices. So the vessels in the esophagus get um, enlarged. And so you can have upper GI bleeds that are pretty bad. People having, you know, hematemesis or vomiting blood um, and can be very unstable because those varices can really open up and lose a lot of blood. And you can have these like what's called caput medusae. And if you guys have seen these, but these little like um, vascular formations on the skin. 
And then certainly the liver has a lot of um, functions of making things as well, right? So it makes the factors that help you clot. Um, so a lot of the time, uh, folks who have end-stage liver disease will um, bleed very easily. Um, they will have um, a lot of hormonal effects as well. They can be jaundiced and edematous um, as well. And then one other thing is that when their liver doesn't work, um, there's going to be a bunch of fluid in their abdomen. So they're going to have ascites. Um, and one thing we always think about is that acidic fluid can actually get infected. So spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is also another potential diagnosis that we think about with these folks. Um, didn't want to go through all of those, but just kind of a general overview um, on some GI effects. And any questions on pancreatitis or the liver? <clears throat> All right. Your next patient, because everyone has abdominal pain, right? They had a, oh, do any of those issues present at GERD? Yes, you can get a lot of irritation of the stomach lining from all the alcohol intake um, and can develop ulcers um, as well um, and can have certainly, um, can have like a gastric reflux. Uh, but certainly that's the, the, the least scary out of all of those other things that can happen. All right, so 63-year-old, epigastric abdominal pain. You get there, she's diaphoretic. Uh-oh, I don't like this. She says it's acute onset, pretty severe. It's epigastric, it radiates to the left arm. She feels a little short of breath, but she's like, I don't know, it just feels like really bad indigestion. She takes metformin, atorvastatin, and lisinopril because um, she has uh, diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. And uh, ate dinner about two hours ago. And then this kind of sudden onset while she was watching TV and then she tried to go up her stairs and it got worse. Um, to answer the question about pancreatitis real quick is, uh, yes, it can affect the patient's ability to manage blood sugar levels in the chronic stage. So when your pancreas is burnt out from repeat episodes of pancreatitis, it doesn't make insulin anymore. And so you're, um, you have diabetes, essentially, your, uh, <clears throat> your blood sugars are all over the place. Um, to go back to case five, I hear cardiac. Yep, definitely something to think about. 12 lead, 12 lead. <laughs> so a little hypertensive, um, a little bit tachypnic, setting okay though. And her belly's not tender. Um, her She has regular heart sounds, equal pulses, clear lungs. But yeah, 12 lead cardiac, can't fool you guys. Um, you already know what your differential and you want to get a 12 lead. And it's a STEMI. Of course it is, right? So this just serves as a reminder that... Um, Epigastric and kind of upper abdominal pain in folks who have coronary artery disease uh, risk factors, think about getting a 12 lead. Um, typical symptoms of ACS, right? We think of chest pain, arm pain, jaw pain, dull, heavy, crushing, et cetera. But about 30% of people who have ACS, whether that's STEMI, NSTEMI, uh, unstable angina, what have you, don't actually have chest pain. So up to 30%. And it's what we call these atypical symptoms, although we really should call them more. I don't know, sort of not typical because if up to 30% don't have chest pain, it's not uncommon, right? That's where you get the epigastric pain or the back pain um, that's like burning, stabbing, maybe feels like indigestion. Um, they can also have dyspnea, so shortness of breath. They can be sweaty. They can have nausea and vomiting a lot of the time um, or even like facial pain. Atypical presentations are tend to be more common in women than in men. Um, and may contribute to a lower likelihood of diagnosis, right, in treatment, uh, to us missing it. Oh, it's just, you know, it's upper abdominal pain. It's it's gastritis or it's indigestion. Um, when women do have typical symptoms, which they do, women and men both have typical symptoms. Men are, or women are slightly more likely to have atypical symptoms. But when they have typical symptoms, it's actually more predictive of a diagnosis of MI um, than when men have it. And then the other risk factors also are if patients are older, if they have diabetes, possibly due to their nerves not working very well, right? And kind of the crossing of signals and everything. Um, if they are hypertensive and if they have a prior history of heart failure. Um, it happens in angina and STEMI, STEMI and all of these things. So remember to think about ACS in an older patient, um, especially if you have diabetes and high blood pressure and other coronary artery uh, disease risk factors, 
who has upper abdominal pain. If it's right lower quadrant abdominal pain, okay, it's probably not ACS, but anything like epigastric, right upper, left upper, just think about it um, and just snap that 12 lead it's, if it's within your scope um, because certainly don't want to miss that. And then obviously you're going to treat as usual with aspirin and all the good things. Any questions? <clears throat> awesome. This time around, you have a 72 year old male with abdominal pain. He's very uncomfortable when you get there. He's clearly distressed. He's writhing around, can't get comfortable. He said, it kind of started after dinner last night. It progressed. Then it became constant, pretty diffuse. He's had a couple episodes of vomiting. <clears throat> he takes just a medication for blood pressure. He has atrial fibrillation and peripheral vascular disease, but he doesn't take any blood thinners. Uh, last time he ate was last night and just kind of has been feeling crappy since. Man, cold flu. <laughs> um, he's a little bit hypertensive, a little bit tachycardic, <laughs> but not overtly febrile um, and a little bit uh, tachyptic as well. His belly is pretty diffusely tender and you, you know, feel for his pulse and it's irregularly regular. We told you he has a history of AFib. Beyond the man cold or the man flu. Um, he's not distended. He's not super rigid. He's doing a little bit of like voluntary guarding, but he's not distended or rigid. Good question. Dissection aorta. Definitely something to think about. <clears throat> no fever. I don't know. This one might stump you guys. These are all great thoughts, though. No, it does not have a different BP on left and right. I like it, though. Sepsis, definitely consideration. He has atrial fibrillation, peripheral vascular disease. He has got mesenteric ischemia. Um, but all of those things are definitely things you should be thinking about. Um, <clears throat> bowel obstruction, aortic problems, et cetera. Mesenteric ischemia is tricky. It's sneaky, and I think we miss it. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's it's a, it's a hard one to think about, really, even, even in the hospital. So this is pretty rare, but it has a really high mortality within the first 24 hours if it's not recognized. Um, and some uh, risk factors are peripheral artery disease, coronary artery disease, and atrial fibrillation. Basically, what this is is the you know the remember the the colon has this mesentery that has all of these vessels that supply it with blood flow, and so if you have hyperlipidemia and already have some narrowed vessels from cholesterol buildup, um, <clears throat> it can happen really one of two ways: either you have uh, embolic episode, kind of like how atrial fibrillation increases your risk for stroke. You have a clot in your atria, it gets passed along, and instead of lodging up into the brain, it lodges into one of these vessels and basically cuts off blood supply. And this little piece of bowel is now ischemic um, and starts to die in necrosis. Or less commonly, it can happen from low blood pressure. So somebody who, um, let's say, has low blood pressure for another reason, let's say they're septic or um, you know something else happened, uh, very dehydrated where the blood pressure is low, they already have these narrowed vessels. If you're not getting good blood flow in there, then you're basically going to be just hypoperfuse and have ischemia. Either way, the bowel starts to infarct and die. Presents with abdominal pain classically 30 to 60 minutes after eating, because that's when that blood flow, when the you know nutrients and stuff get to that part, when the blood flow really starts to ramp up because you need it all to digest. So that's kind of when it presents. Um, you can have nausea and vomiting as well. You can have some diarrhea. You can have GI bleeding. Because if you can imagine, if you have an ischemic bowel, it's going to be irritated and start to bleed. On exam, you're classically taught that the patient has like pain out of proportion, which means that when you push on their belly, it's not impressive, but they're like super uncomfortable. But as you guys have read or learned, uh, a lot of patients don't actually read the textbook. Um, so what is classically taught, it does not actually usually end up being the case. Um, certainly should perk your ears up if that's the case, but it's about like 50% sensitive. So I wouldn't count on that and say, 
oh, well, they don't have that. Their belly's pretty tender, so it can't be mesenteric ischemia because this hurts. Your gut is dead, right? It's going to be very painful. Pre-hospital, you're going to fluid resuscitate those folks to improve that perfusion if this is what you're thinking about um, <clears throat> because that's going to you know, do your best to get that blood flow going back to that area of the bowel that's perfused. You're going to treat their pain and you're going to um, treat their nausea as well. And then if they're hypotensive and you have a long transport after, you know, fluid resuscitation, you can certainly consider vasopressors. The tricky part with vasopressors is that the a lot of them actually cause vasoconstriction, right? So they may cause worsening vasoconstriction of the vessels that are already constricted, the vessels that are going to the um, to the gut. So it's kind of a darn if you do, darn if you don't situation. Um, dopamine, which is not my favorite presser is actually, um, one that doesn't do that as much, um, compared to like epinephrine and phenylephrine and the other ones in the hospital, we're going to give these folks antibiotics. Their gut is dying, uh, maybe perforating there's bacteria everywhere. So they get antibiotics. They may or may not get heparin. Um, and that's, if we think it's probably from like a, uh, embolic, so like a clot in the right atrium that started there and then or left atrium and moved on, then they may get heparin. It's going to be a conversation with surgery. And then depending on the cause, they may need to have, and how far along they are, they may need to have their bowel taken out, um, right, most likely. And so it's going to be either surgery or interventional radiology, depending on the hospital and kind of what resources they have. Any questions? That was a tricky one. <clears throat> The X is right. <clears throat> and we diagnose this usually with a special kind of CT. It's a CT angiogram. It just shoots the contrast to light up the arteries better um, than our usual CT scans. Um, but uh, yeah, pretty, pretty scary diagnosis to make. All right. <clears throat> you have a 55-year-old male, uh, excuse me, female, who presents with abdominal pain and vomiting. On arrival, looks uncomfortable actively vomiting tells you it's kind of gradual onset pretty severe belly's distended a lot of vomiting constipation hasn't actually had a bowel movement for like 12 hours and hasn't only been passing any gas um has had a bunch of surgeries doesn't have an appendix so you know it's not appendicitis doesn't have a gallbladder same thing had a hysterectomy probably not pregnant so you can take all of those things off the list uh last meal was about 12 hours ago and uh, yeah, she's just vomiting and feels pretty crummy. Vitals are okay, or blood pressure is okay, I should say. A little bit tachycardic, um, otherwise okay. Bowel obstruction, kidney stones, and bowel obstruction. On payments, constipated. Good question. She's not on any payments. And on your exam, she's pretty distended. And she's kind of generally tender all over the place. Leaning more towards bowel now. Kidney stone is a great thought. <clears throat> and I will spoil alert and say I did not put kidney stone in here. Um, but definitely keep that on your list. And diverticulitis, also a, a great thing that could be going on with her. But this one is a bowel obstruction. Her recent motor surgeries. Uh, good question. 10 years ago and two years ago. Uh, I don't know, I'm making it up. Uh, this patient has a bowel obstruction. Uh, twisted gut basically. Um, so the intestines can become partially or completely blocked. Um, and the contents, as you can imagine, because this is kind of like a, a one-way uh, movement, the contents can get backed up. Uh, that can cause inflammation. A couple of things that can cause obstructions. It can be a tumor. So folks with um, uh, colon cancer, small bowel cancer can have uh, this, can have a blockage cause this. Um, they can have, uh, foreign bodies. Um, if they, you know, swallowed something, it can even be impacted stool. Um, however, what we worry about is more so from adhesions from previous surgeries. So when you open up that peritoneal cavity, remember there's peritoneum that kind of lines everything when you cut through it and, you know, take out the gallbladder, take out the appendix, what have you, then it kind of forms adhesions in between the top of the uh, wall of the abdomen and then kind of down to whatever, you know, the parietal peritoneum. So the parietal and visceral peritoneum kind of form these little tiny adhesions. And so you can imagine that, you know, you got a bunch of bowel floating around. If it gets twisted around one of those things, it can get twisted on itself, right? And then completely blocked. 
It can also happen with a herniation. So if you have a hernia, we always say, you know, is it possible that there's bowel in there? Are they vomiting? Because that means that the hernia, um, the bowel is stuck in that hernia and it's obstructed basically. Um, but commonly we worry about kind of folks who have had um, surgeries. You can get a large bowel obstruction as well, but most of the time it's a small bowel obstruction. Um, I think just because there's more of it and it's more kind of free floating around in there is my guess, but I don't know exactly, but small bowel obstruction is much more common. These patients will have pretty distended abdomen because if they are, if the bowel is obstructed, they're not passing anything. They're not passing contents. They're not passing gas. And so the bowel tends to get pretty stretched out. So their you know, belly is pretty distended because of that. Um, <clears throat> bowel obstruction is not great. It's uncomfortable. Um, they need treatment. Certainly it's not an acute life threat in the next five to 10 minutes, but it is something that needs treatment. However, you can imagine if the bowel is obstructed, it gets twisted on itself. It's not getting any good blood flow. So you, the intestine is going to start to necrose. Um, and so you can actually get, you know, perforation and other badness um, happen with that. And Jolyn says that the worst pain I've ever felt from a small bowel herniation. Yeah, it's pretty uncomfortable. And like I said, it can perforate, right? Um, and so... This not only from bowel obstruction, but also folks who have had radiation, inflammatory bowel disease, et cetera, their, their bowels are more thinned out and can perforate. Um, but you can also have a stomach perforation from a, a bad ulcer, um, kind of will look the same as well. You can imagine if you perforate, right, it's going to spill the contents like we were talking about into your abdominal cavity, and that's not going to be great. It's going to irritate everything, cause infection, cause a lot of badness and pain. And then this on what we see on this X-ray is that, you know, we see the heart here, lungs, got the nice diaphragm on this side. On this side, there's your stomach right there and there's that air right there. That's because air rises. And so on an upright chest X-ray, if you have a perforated bowel, perforated stomach, there's a lot of air in our, in our GI tract. And so it'll kind of rise to the top and that's kind of something that can give you a clue um, that there's a bowel perforation. What are you gonna do pre-hospital? Pretty much supportive care, pain, nausea management, really important. Um, these folks are going to be pretty nauseous and pretty uncomfortable. And then it, certainly IV fluids because they've probably been vomiting a lot. Um, in the hospital, we're going to get some type of imaging. Usually a CT scan is how we're going to make this, this diagnosis. If it's a bowel obstruction, um, they don't always necessarily need surgery. Sometimes we put in an NG tube, which I don't know if you guys have had any, but I hear is like the worst thing we do to people in the hospital. Um, it can get an NG tube to kind of decompress the bowel from the top and give it a little bit of room to kind of untwist itself. And a lot of the time this works. Sometimes it doesn't and you need surgery and you need to be opened up and untwisted. Um, and then if it's perforated, then certainly you're going to need surgery because now the contents are all over your peritoneal cavity and you're going to need antibiotics as well. Any questions on bowel obstructions or bowel perforation? Pretty uncomfy stuff. <clears throat> All right. And last but not least, case eight, you're going to have a 76 year old male with abdominal pain. You guys have picked up that that's kind of the theme today. He's pale. He's diaphoretic. He's uncomfortable. He's in moderate distress. He has some pain, it radiates into the lower back and also maybe some numbness and tingling of his legs. Um, he takes medication for hypertension and hyperlipidemia. He is a cigarette smoker. He had a little snack about two hours ago. He was fine after that. And then uh, the pain was pretty sudden. These are his vitals. Blood pressure is a little high, a little tachycardic. <clears throat> and... Um, not set, uh, setting well on Romero though. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's pretty tender and kind of guarding all over the place. Um, and then you feel pulses and there's pedal pulses, but it's kind of diminished compared to the radial pulses. He's pretty diaphoretic. I already saw a lot of chat in there about either aortic dissection or triple A. <clears throat> yeah, those are definitely the, the top of my list. So... Let's talk about the aorta. 
the aorta, like all vessels in the body have three main layers, right? There's the intima, which is the innermost media, which is obviously the middle one, and then the outside, which is the adventitia. And remember the aorta is, um, you know, it's a huge vessel, it goes all the way from your heart, all the way down <clears throat> and it gives off roots to some pretty important things, right? There's renal vessels and all that other stuff. The aorta can cause a lot of problems. And really the two main problems we care about um, or that or at least that we'll talk about is a triple A or uh, an abdominal aortic aneurysm or a dissection. So when the walls of the aorta thin out, they can dilate and they can bulge out like this, right? Uh, triple A is when it is dilated at least 150% of the normal size. The wall is weakening and it's usually from kind of degenerative cardiovascular disease, right? So just age-related and, and uh, other uh, kind of factors like that. Usually it's seen in the media. So that middle layer is the one that kind of gets weak and it kind of bulges out. A lot of the time aneurysms are going to be below the origin of the renal arteries. Um, so kind of like, you know, middle to lower abdomen. Some risk factors to consider for AAA is atherosclerosis. So if you have um, a bunch of cholesterol in your vessels, going to weaken the walls. Smoking weakens it as well. Advanced age and male sex are a big risk factors. Um, and then certainly family history, high blood pressure, um, and prior aortic problems are going to be uh, going to perk your ears up. The There's like a, a study that looked at kind of like an autopsy studies and found that it's anywhere from 0.5 to 3% um, of folks have a triple A. And uh, it really, it increases after age 60 and kind of peaks in the seventh and eighth decades of life. So certainly something that we get as we are older. A lot of the time you have a AAA, but it's really just identified incidentally. Um, maybe you're getting a you know CT for another reason. And actually, if you just have a AAA, not necessarily mean that you have symptoms, um, you know, it, it, depending on the size and everything else. When they are... Um, when it becomes problematic is when they become really large. Because as you can imagine, when they get really big, there's a lot of pressure. Remember, aorta is a high pressure system. So there's a lot of pressure on those walls when it gets larger because they're thinner. So they're more likely to rupture. Um, when it expands really fast, same thing. It can really weaken. And then really what we care about is when a AAA ruptures. So this is when it's life-threatening. Um, this can vary depending on where it's ruptured, if it's contained or not, if you know you're frankly bleeding into your belly or just in the area around the aneurysm, has a lot of different presentations. They can, however, present in shock, right, with diffuse abdominal pain and distension because you're bleeding in the belly, or they can be a little bit more subtle about it too. <clears throat> if it's a really bad ruptured triple A that is bleeding into your belly because of the high pressure system of the aorta, they may not even make it to the hospital and they may not even make it to you getting there. Um, they may already have bled out, basically. Uh, but if they do, it can be pretty tender over this area. Um, and then kind of depending on where it's rupturing into can have different effects, right? So it can rupture into the kidneys. It can rupture into the other vessels that give off from the aorta. <clears throat> rupture is rare. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, we monitor, once, once it's diagnosed, you monitor it. And when it gets above a certain size, you repair it to prevent it from rupturing. So rupture is rare. But when it happens, as you can imagine, it's a really high mortality rate. Sometimes it can be retroperitoneal rupture too. So back here. Um, and so when that happens, they can present with hypotension and then they actually kind of stabilize because the retroperitoneum can't hold as much blood as the rest of your abdominal cavity and it kind of tamponades. Um, and so it kind of, you know, tamponades the bleeding itself. Um, what do we do about this? Well, I don't do anything besides resuscitate them, but what it, what the definitive treatment is, is either surgical or endovascular. So either open it up, um, you know, they go on bypass, um, have a machine that's um, doing their uh, basically um, blood, whatever filtration for them, and then put in this graft, or they go through the vessels and put it in kind of endovascularly. When are you going to suspect this? If it's an older male, it uh, tends to be Caucasian that has a higher um, predisposition to this. If they have abdominal pain, back pain, flank pain. So, you know, we think about older folks with kidney stones when they do like flank pain, oh, it must be a kidney stone. Really have to be careful that we don't miss an aorta problem uh, because a kidney stone can masquerade as an aorta problem. 
Um, and then certainly if they have any neurological symptoms or other symptoms, you should prick up your ears about this could be something uh, vascular, right? Because if the aorta, the aneurysm is leaking and it's causing issues and the uh, vessels distal aren't getting good blood flow, then you're going to have, you know, the, you're going to have like ischemia and everything else of your legs, for example. Pulsatile mass is what's classically taught. Um, but I'll be honest, especially with like body habitus and everything, it's going to be pretty hard for you to feel a pulsatile mass in a patient. Uh, maybe pretty hard to distinguish. And then, you know, you, we say, listen for a brewy cause you know, it's going to be abnormal blood flow, but especially in the lab environment, if you're, you know, running with lights and sirens, good luck hearing that. Um, so just look at these other things and kind of have your um, a high suspicion. Uh, what are you going to do? You're going to give them oxygen for shock. You are going to uh, do cardiac monitoring, large bore IVs. You're going to resuscitate them. Right now we have volume, but maybe soon we'll have blood. You're going to resuscitate them and then you're going to do pain management. And then diesel, lots of diesel, absolutely diesel therapy, um, whether that is your ambulance driving fast or whether that is the helicopter that is flying in um, <clears throat> to get the patient. And then the other big problem that the aorta can cause, remember, is aortic dissection. So um, remember those kind of three layers we talked about, right? The inner, the middle, and the outer. What happens in a dissection is when there's a tear in the innermost layer, so it's that intima, and so blood is injected under pretty high pressure. Remember, aorta is a high pressure system. Um, and then it uh, it goes in there, right? And so um, the it's not great. That's not where you want the blood to go. You want it to go in here. And so that's kind of what basically what an aortic dissection is. It can happen from a couple of different reasons. Um, it can happen tra traumatically. It can be a genetic connective tissue disease like Marfan's. Uh, but a lot of the time, it's going to be an older person with hypertension, and that's really the, the main cause. There's two big types that we talk about, type A and type B. Um, this is more for like FYI knowledge. Uh, type A is when there's any on the like candy cane part of the aorta, and then type B is when it's just on the descending part. Um, and the reason why it matters is we'll treat it differently. Type B may just be medical management, depending on the extent, whereas type A always needs uh, surgical management. The symptoms, you're going to have pain, right? The, what we're classically taught is that like ripping, tearing chest pain with radiation to the neck or between the shoulder blades um, goes from zero to 60. The, again, patients don't really use the textbook, uh, read the textbook, so it may not be that classic presentation. It's possible to have no pain at all. They can be dizzy, they can have lightheadedness, they can be syncopal, um, right? They can have vasovagal syncope because of their reaction to that severe pain. Um, and then depending on where the dissection is and what organs are involved, you may have symptoms resulting from that, right? So let's say the dissection is here and it dissects up into the car uh, carotids, it's gonna look like a stroke. If it you know, dissects into where the coronary arteries are getting their blood flow right here, then it's gonna look like a heart attack. Um, and then if it's gonna go all the way down, it's, it can affect their lower extremities. Um, so usually when I consider of an aortic dissection is when there's chest pain and, so chest pain and neurologic symptoms, weakness, for example, or dizziness or stroke-like symptoms, um, chest pain and abdominal pain, because it's dissecting all the way down, chest pain and leg weakness, right? So chest pain and, even though they don't all have chest pain, but if you hear of a chest pain and situation, um, have this in the back of your mind. Um, what are you going to do? Pretty limited interventions that... Um, that we can do pre-hospital, um, but certainly recognition and suspicion is or suspecting this is going to be huge um, and communicate that, right? Wherever you are transporting the patient. And ideally, they're going to need to go somewhere with a cardiothoracic surgeon, right? I can lower their blood pressure and their heart rate as much as I want in the ER, but eventually they're going to need surgery. Um, definitely two large bore IVs in case they have cardiovascular collapse, because these folks are very, very, very tenuous. Um, and then, you know, treat their symptoms. So treat their pain. Remember when you treat pain, the like adrenaline release and catecholamine release kind of goes down a little bit, which means that their blood pressure isn't going to be as high. Their heart rate isn't going to be as high. So treating pain really kind of helps with management of this acute aortic dissection. Um, and then if they're nauseous and vomiting, that force of vomiting can make this worse too, right? It can make the dissection worse or extend. So treat their symptoms, give them pain meds, give them, um, uh, anti-nausea meds, it's going to be really important. And then when they get to the ER, they're going to have um, a couple of interventions. They're going to have their blood pressure lowered and their heart rate lowered. 
Um, this is to kind of decrease that like shearing force on the vessels. Usually we actually go to heart rate goal of 60 and systolic of 90. So we lower them pretty, pretty low so that there isn't as much blood kind of, you know, uh, smack in the wall of that aorta. Um, and then the definitive treatment, uh, like I said, depends on where it is and how extensive it is. We'll often need um, surgery. So you think this guy has a triple A rupture. What are you going to do with him? Right. And this leads us into kind of like that discussion of the role considerations of all of this. Um, so do you ever need an air transport for abdominal pain? I would say yes. Right. Depending on what resources you have in your area, if it's going to if it's something that's going to be triple A or like dissection or something that's going to need immediate surgery that the hospital that you would most likely transport to doesn't have. Um, then you absolutely need to call the the chopper. Um, and you know, in the in a in a urban setting where everything's five minutes away, does it matter as much if you're thinking, oh, is this appendicitis versus cholecystitis, et cetera? Not really, right? And I've heard a lot of medics and EMTs be like, well, does it really matter? I'm going to do the same thing no matter what's causing the belly pain. All right, fair, I guess, if it's like a two minute transport time. But when you have a longer transport time and you're kind of needing to pick your destinations based on their availability of specialists then I think it's very important for you to kind of have this in the back of your head, like, okay, what kind of surgeon is this person going to need, right? Are they going to need <clears throat> some type of general surgery, which, you know, maybe the local hospital does or does not, um, or are they going to need vascular surgery, which a lot of smaller places are not going to have access to? Is there a gynecologist or an OB doc there that can deal with a um, ruptured ectopic pregnancy? Is there pediatric surgeons? Some trauma surgeons will do ob procedures and will do pediatric surgeons or pediatric patients, but some won't. So kind of just knowing what your closest facilities have and what capabilities they have is really important. Um, and then if you do need to call the helicopter or um, you know fixed wing to get the patient out to a specialist. And then the big thing is pain management. So back in like, I don't know, a couple of years ago, a long time ago, we used to say that, you know, if you treat somebody's abdominal pain with a real pain medication, it's going to decrease the ability for the diagnosis. Um, that, that's not really the case anymore. Um, we, that was maybe more the case when we didn't have access to imaging, but like giving your patient fentanyl for their abdominal pain is not going to fool the CT scanner into hiding the appendicitis, right? So treat your pain, your patients, um, especially with the prolonged transports, um, give them pain, whatever you have, right? IV, oral, whatever your agency carries, um, whatever medications you have, treat them. Don't be afraid to treat their um, pain is basically it. You are not going to mess their ability to be accurately diagnosed. All right. I'm going to talk about the new CE credit process real quick, and then I will leave um, it up for you guys to ask any questions. So we are introducing a new, more a streamlined way to do it. So instead of you having to email Ryan Shelton um, to get credit, we are actually going to do it with the QR code. We have moved into the 20th century. So um, everybody needs to scan and input just some basic information. It's going to be like your name, your agency, your level of provider. Um, either scan it now if you have a cell phone um, that you can easily access or uh, take a picture of it, take a screenshot or whatever, and then scan it later, um, complete it later. Um, if you have a bunch of people hanging out in the same place, everybody needs to scan and input their information. We're not doing it as a group anymore. And then the certificate should be pretty automatic and will be emailed off of that email address that you provide. Um, so go ahead and do that, get your credit, get your CE, and then I will take any questions or comments.